All right, guys, welcome back, true biologists. Let's not waste any time. Let's talk microtubules. Let's talk what they do and how they do it. What are the things that microtubules do in cells? We have transport. Okay, so the, the microtubule network goes throughout the cells and the, the microtubule uh, filaments themselves are used as the tram lines uh, upon which organelles uh, such as vesicles are moved around the cell and generally how the cell maintains the organization of all its internal components. Okay, so when we're talking transport, uh, we are talking uh, things like vesicles, other organelles, and we're talking about using this as a way to also maintain a certain organization of the cell. Okay, next. Next, we have the separation of chromosomes during cell division. So chromosome separation, the aligning of the chromosomes uh, on the equator of the cell, and then the attachment of the spindle fibers to the chromosomes and the, the, the separation of the chromosomes to the opposite poles of the cell, that is all done using microtubules as the structural framework for the spindle fibers. Okay. Um, okay, so the chromosome separation during cell division. Okay, we're talking about spindle fibers, okay, and the centrosome and all of that. Uh, next we have, then we've got finally, we also have the cilia and the flagella. Now I know these are structures, not functions, but we're just going to look at them slightly separately. Now cilia and flagella, they have overlapping and somewhat distinct roles. Even though structurally they are very similar, um, flagella, we can say flagella, the main role of the flagella is motility, so to move the cell. Okay, so the flagellum has the main role to move the cell. And at this point, um, I just want to mention that whereas eukaryotic cells um, have flagella, Bacteria, you know, uh, prokaryotic cells also have flagella, but they have a very different structure. Even though functionally they're similar, the structure is very different. Um, and so uh, this discussion is not about flagella in general, it's about the microtubule-based flagella of the eukaryotic cells. Okay, so flagella is motility. Cilia also has, cilia has a kind of related function. So cilia can be mobile just like flagella. The mobile cilia's function is not to generate movement for the cell, but rather to move fluid, move fluid over cells. So to move fluid over cells, that's the job of the cilia, and we'll come back to that too. All right. Um, but also, cilia have a non-mobile, non-motile version, which is more, uh, which has a more sensory role. Okay, uh, in, uh, in things like sight and smell, cilia have a function in that. These are the overall function of the microtubules that you're likely to come across in uh, studying biology at this level. And what we will now do is look at the structure of the microtubules, generally speaking, before then going on to see how the, the microtubule structure is modified and adapted so that it can achieve all this range of functionality. What we'll do now is look at the general structure of the microtubules. As we've already said, that microtubules do a whole range of things in the cell, and in order to do those different things, um, the structure and arrangement has to get slightly modified. So what we'll do first is just look at, generally, what's, what's the basic structure of the microtubule filaments. Okay, so um, again, uh, microtubules are formed of globular, proteins um, and the protein that makes the microtubules is called tubulin right and it's a globular protein it's not fibrous 
um, so similar to actin um, or the actin filaments, they're made up of a globular protein. Similarly, tubulin is made up of globular proteins, unlike the intermediate filaments, which are made up of fibrous proteins. So tubulin comes in two forms, alpha and beta. And both of these proteins separately exist. However, they come together to form um, a heterodimer, i.e. it's uh, a dimeric protein, but each of the two subunits is different. Okay, so this is the basic repeating unit that makes up the um, microtubules. So this is our, essentially this is our subunit, okay, our, our microtubule subunit. So that's our microtubule subunit. Now the subunit then comes together to form a long filament. Again, these proteins join end to end, as we've discussed for the other cytoskeletal elements, proteins joining end to end to make up um, a filament type structure. So in this case, I hope I get the order right, but I believe the what happens is that these subunits come together like this. So that's one subunit, that's another subunit, so we've got two subunits now, and that's a third subunit right there, and so on, that's a fourth subunit. Okay, so all of these, so that's each of these subunits, they come together, and what this is called, this is a protofilament, and you'll see why, because this is still not the final structure of the microtubule. So we're going to call this a protofilament because it's kind of there. So this is kind of this is the thing that forms before the final thing. So it's the protofilament like prototype. Okay, not not the finished article. So now what happens is that these 13, 13 protofilaments come together to form a cylindrical structure that is our final microtubule. So if you bear with me. Okay, so we've got 13 uh, protofilaments arranged in a cylindrical uh, format, and that is essentially our microtubule, final microtubule structure, okay? Not only that, I, I want to discuss, because this is going to um, be important a bit later, that this um, microtubule structure has a polarity, inherent polarity to it. I don't know if you've noticed, um, but just like the actin filaments um, that, you know, their formation and disassembly was an important part of uh, how they were able to form different kinds of structures and how their structures could be regulated, controlled, uh, or reorganized. Uh, again, with similar or the same kind of thing is true. The same kind of thing is true for the microtubule, which has um, an inherent polarity to it, which is that one end is kind of more fluctuating. So one end is more fluctuating and that end, because it can grow quickly, but at the same time it can shrink more quickly, it's called the plus end, okay, plus end. And we'll be referring to that throughout uh, the, 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 the next parts of the video. So, so this plus end can grow quickly when required, but it can also shrink very quickly as per the requirements of the cell. Again, that's controlled by other factors in the cell, cell signaling, other proteins that attach to these uh, fibers and so on. Okay, and we have the other side, which is called the negative end, not because it shrinks more quickly, but because it's more stable. 
okay so it kind of nothing happens to that end pretty much okay so we have the uh, more stable we have the more stable negative or, or minus end minus end there so that's the basics of your microtube or the essentials won't call them basics but the essentials of the microtubule structure okay um, you can skip on ahead if you want to I'm just going to recap this so it's a globular protein that makes it up it's the, that globular protein is tubulin and there are two isoforms of it so there's two uh, different polypeptide sequences different proteins um, and those different proteins come together to form this dimer made of the two different uh, proteins and that's our repeating unit called the microtubule subunit that subunit repeats by joining end to end to form a protofilament. The protofilament, 13 of them come together in a cylindrical format to form the microtubule structure. Okay, it's quite strong, but its main purpose in the cell is not strength and support. I must apologize, guys, in all the excitement about the microtubule structure, uh, I forgot to mention one key point that when those uh, 13 protofilaments come together the width of the microtubule that is produced is you guessed it it is around about 25 nanometers okay making it therefore the thickest of the three cytoskeletal filaments that we've looked at actin being the uh, thinnest then we got the intermediate filaments then finally the microtubules all right so without further ado let us now look at the range of functions that microtubules can be uh, involved in and how those are done with uh, variations on this basic structure generally speaking how are microtubules organized in the cell okay so we're just going to have an example here of um, uh, a cell okay uh, it's maybe it's a migratory cell and that's this nucleus right there now the microtubules the microtubules are formed or the microtubules are organized with their um, minus ends so the the place where they're more, most stable is at the centrosome okay or otherwise known as the microtubule organizing center okay um, you will know that they have that centriole structure right there a pair of centrioles organized at an angle to each other and we'll look briefly at that, that structure it is still generally composed of uh, or it is still a microtubule based structure so it's not something completely different from what we've already discussed okay so we have that uh, microtubule organizing center or the centrosome okay now so that's that's where the microtubules um, are formed from okay or that's their hub or headquarters if you will okay so we have the centrosome there and the microtubules are then um, radiating out from the centrosome outwards setting up the basic organization of the cell now the centrosome is usually hanging around the nucleus okay now you've got the microtubule there now the important thing is that the stable end of the microtubule the neg the minus end is always at the centrosome okay so you've got the minus end there and the plus ends which are liable to quick shrinkage and quick growing they are kind of you know pushing outwards at the cell or reaching out for the cell uh, borders okay so you've got these fibers negative ends are there negative positive negative positive and so on okay positive negative and so on I don't have to do that for every single one. okay so that's generally the organization that you might see in a migratory cell now uh, this is a migratory cell 
other cells, columnar epithelial cells, um, you know, muscle cells, they might not have the same polarity in terms of a, you know, a back and front. But generally speaking, the, you know, the polarity of the cell, however it may be, like uh, epithelial cells have top and bottom, um, and so on, uh, that kind of polarity is uh, determined by the microtubule because it's, the, remember the micro as we'll discuss, the microtubule network is used to ensure that everything in the cell is where it's supposed to be. Okay, so this polarity is set out by the uh, centrosome and the orientation of the microtubules uh, as determined by the centrosome. Okay, so now let's look a little bit more closely at that centrosome before we move on. So if we're just going to zoom in to this structure, uh, so the centrosome is made up of a pair of centrioles. Each centriole is essentially a microtubule based structure. Okay. Um, however, the arrangement of the microtubules here is, is quite unique. The uh, microtubules or the centrioles are formed by a radial arrangement of microtubule triplets. Okay, so if, if, if we were saying that this would be one microtubule filament here, so that's another fiber and another, so that's three microtubule, uh, three microtubules put together form one of these, and then nine of them, nine of those triplets come together to form one centriole, and you've got two centrioles, always at a, a slight angle to each other. Okay, don't ask me, I didn't design this. Okay, now, um, with relation, in relation to this structure now, what its job is, is to form the organizing center for the microtubules. So in relation to what, in relation to this, the centrosome is the base for all the minus ends of the microtubules. So you can think of it as the microtubules kind of going out into the far reaches of the cell but all their negative ends are um, founded or, or based here at the centrosome. So if this is a kind of, you know, spherical uh, structure, then you're going to have fibers coming out at various points of this. All right. So always with their negative ends here, but these microtubules, then they've got positive ends or plus ends that are growing very fast and will shrink when needed too, but they're based on this organizing center. Okay, oops now. Yeah, something like that. You've got some at the back as well. All right, so yeah, so that's that's the general arrangement. Quick recap, okay? The cell it has a network of microtubules. Those uh, microtubules originate at the centrosome, with their minus stable ends at the centrosome and their plus ends uh, towards the cell perimeter. At the centrosome, then. The centrosome is composed of two centrioles or a pair of centrioles. Each centriole uh, is composed of nine radially arranged uh, microtubule triplets, okay, kind of juxtaposed to each other at an angle and uh, forming then the basis of the negative or, or forming the basis of the minus ends of the microtubules that go out to the cell perimeter. So these are the general elements that I wanted to discuss before we go on. So before we go on to the next part then, the question is this, how is it that that, what, that thing that we talked about, the microtubule, basic microtubule structure, how could that be used for transport? How could that be used for chromosome separation? How could that be used to make a structure that could move cells? And how could that be used to make a structure that could be used for sensory functions? Okay, so that's the next thing that we'll do.
the way that microtubules can do all those range of functions is actually not by itself. Microtubule functions are largely, in large part, down to the secret source of proteins known as motor motor proteins. Now what motor proteins do is um, they, and I know this sounds a little bit like magic, which is exactly the opposite of the point of these videos, um, but essentially if we do have a microtubule uh, filament, okay, we have established that there is a, a minus end and a plus end, all right? And you've got the 13 protofilaments come together to make this. Motor proteins are proteins that attach themselves to the microtubule filaments and move along them. And on one end, they attach to the microtubule itself and walk along it, but the other end um, can bind to a, a range of different things and those and and whatever it binds to on the other end essentially determines what its uh, function is in the cell okay so motor proteins we have they are not brand new to us in concept we already discussed how uh, myosin proteins attach to actin filaments so they they have a globular end which they bind the actin filament change shape and move the actin filament further along, detach, bind further along, change shape again, moving the uh, actin fiber along, detach, change shape, bind again, and thereby they can move the actin fiber when they are stationary. But imagine that it was the fiber that was stationary and the um, motor protein that, that could move. So what would happen is it would bind, change shape, and in doing so, it would move along the fiber. And that's essentially what the motor proteins do. What they do is they utilize the uh, energy released when ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP, okay? So for example, we have one group of proteins, I kid you not that they look something like this, okay? So they have this coiled region there, but they have these globular domains something like this, okay? Now, what happens is these proteins, as well as attaching to the microtubule uh, proteins, they, are, they can also change shape. Now, when ATP, so they bind ATP, and they hydrolyze it to ADP plus a phosphate group. Now, this releases energy, and the energy can be used to drive a shape change. And when this one changes its shape, it will kind of flick forward and around so that it is now binding, it is now moved to the front. Okay. And then the one, and then this has now moved to the front. Okay. And then what will happen is that this one, now this one will undergo a similar shape change. It will bind ATP hydrolyze it to ADP, release the ADP, it will also undergo a shape change, and now it will move to the front. Okay, now when it moves to the front, when it moves to the front, the whole protein will have translocated at that point. Okay, so it was there, It was there, but now because these proteins are walking along the microtubule, it is now moving along that in a particular direction. Okay, so that's essentially what motor proteins do. Long story short, they have globular domains that attach to the microtubule filament proteins. They have enzymatic catalytic activity that allows them to hydrolyze ATP to ADP. The energy that is released is used to uh, allow these proteins, uh, pro these domains to change shape. And in changing shape, it allows them to move forward on the microtubule. Okay, so that's what motor proteins do.
Now there's two, there's essentially two families of these motor proteins that we will be looking at. Okay, so the first, pro the first family is the kinesins. Right, so we've got one family called kinesins. Okay, so they bind microtubules, move along it, all that business. But the kinesins, they the key point about them is that they are plus end directed motor proteins. So they always move towards the plus end of the microtubule filament. Another family of motor proteins are called dynenes and in contrast they uh, always move towards the minus end of the microtubule. So depending on how you wanted to move something in the cell uh, all you'd have to do is make sure that they attach to the, the right uh, motor protein and they will then be moved along in that particular direction. Structurally the dynenes are a little bit different instead of looking like this they kind of look more like um, uh, these structures like that and they, they uh, usually occur in pairs okay so again they're just like little feet or legs so while these are like feet walking along the um, microtubule these are like more like leg type structures that you know they're walking in pairs when one is attached, the other one is detached, and then moving forward, and then when that one is attached, the other one will detach and move itself forward, and so on. But the key thing is that the dynenes are moving in that direction towards the minus end of the microtubule. Remember the more stable end, generally speaking, towards the center of the cell. Okay, and the kinesins are moving towards the plus end of the cell along the microtubules, um, generally towards the cell periphery. Okay, so motor proteins then, this is how the magic is going to happen. Now let's see how the motor proteins allow the uh, microtubules to do their different roles. So let's talk intracellular transport then. How are the microtubules and the motor proteins working together to ensure that, um, for example, um, uh, a secretory protein um, processed and packaged at the Golgi apparatus, how is that, um, how, how are those um, synthesized proteins in their vesicle, how do we make sure that they get to the cell membrane where exocytosis can occur and these proteins can be secreted and for example something that is being internalized by the cell, engulfed and um, when, when endocytosis occurs and this um, vesicle is going to be produced on the inside of the cell, how do we make sure that that vesicle can then be rooted back into the cell towards, for example, the lysosome where um, degradation of that material could happen. Okay, so those are just two examples. I'm sure we can think of other examples in the cell where we might be moving vesicles from one place to another. Okay, don't forget also that this same mechanism will be used by the cell to make sure that the Golgi apparatus is just in the right place that it needs to be in the cell. The mitochondria are in the places in the cell where they need to be. So even though we're talking about little vesicles, um, these same mechanisms will be used to make sure that all the organelles of the cell are arranged and you know put in the place where they need to be. Okay, so let's begin. Um, we discussed then the motor proteins, didn't we? And we said that the motor proteins, so even though the microtubules provide the, the road network, shall we say, or the tram lines or the train tracks, it's the motor proteins that will be using those transport networks. Okay, so for example, we have this vesicle, right? It needs to get to the cell membrane, i.e. it needs to move towards the plus end of the microtubules. So what would happen is that these vesicles, um, they would get attached onto plus end directed kinesins, okay? So generally speaking, outward movement, or shall we say outward transport, 
anything where we need to move towards the cell periphery, so outward, outward transport, what we do is attach that cargo, whatever it is, we'd attach that cargo onto the other end of kinesins, right? And kinesins, as long as they have their cargo attached, they will be moving along toward, they will be moving along the microtubule towards the plus end, regardless of the cargo that they are carrying. So they will be doing that. And once we do that, you know, this kinesin will then be transporting the, the attached cargo towards the plus end of the microtubule, i.e. towards the cell membrane, okay? That vesicle will end up near the cell membrane and then, or exocytosis mechanisms will then take over at that point. Protein-protein interactions, cell signaling will ensure that then the membranes fuse, okay? And the protein the, se the secretory protein is then released from the cell, okay? But the way the vesicle got from Golgi to the cell membrane, that's thanks to the kinesins interacting with the microtubule network, okay? So I hope that, that makes sense. Now, moving on, right, how does the reverse work? I'm sure you can put two and two together at this point, but let's say we do generate an intracellular uh, phagosome for example, okay, um, it's got its engulfed particulate stuff here. Okay, now we need to get this vesicle to the lysosome so that these contents can be effectively degraded. Okay, so how do we get movement in the opposite direction? Well, I'm sure you've guessed it, but in this case, we'd attach these to the dynein proteins. Okay, so we'd attach the, this vesicle to dynines and if you're imagining how that might happen remember that vesicles have membranes and membranes have proteins and some of those proteins will be um, their job will be to interact with the dynines or with the kinesins so that the vesicle can be appropriately transported so we attach the vesicle to the dynine the dynines remember okay they are responsible for inward transport okay and so as long as we've attached them to to the right um, motor protein um, that uh, cargo will be transported in a particular direction so this vesicle now moving towards the lysosome delivered by the dynines moving along there okay and once it's close enough Again, other protein-protein interactions will take over at this point, making sure that those two membranes fuse. But once that fusion has happened, these particles will then enter the lysosome, forming the phagolysosome, and thus enabling the hydrolytic enzymes in the lysosome to mix with the internalized extracellular material, and then the uh, hydrolysis of those components will begin. Okay, you forgot our little feet there, our kinesins. Okay, so that, that kind of clarifies things, I hope. Okay, intracellular transport, motor proteins plus microtubules plus any cargo that you want should give you transport towards the outer part of the cell or the inner part of the cell. Magic. All right, guys, so I hope this picture is looking somewhat familiar. Okay, we have a chromosome segregation now. What's happening at that, the time of cell division that results in the sister chromatids being uh, separated from each other equally um, during mitosis or meiosis. Okay, so we have our the centrosome that has duplicated to form the two poles of the spindle. All right, our microtubules then emanating, as we know, from the uh, centrosome. Uh, forming the spindle fibers, okay, and with the minus ends stabilized at the centrosome, the plus ends then reaching outwards from there, seeing what they can attach to. Okay, now some of the microtubules at the plus end, they will grow until they find the centromere 
of the sister chromatids and will attach there. Okay, and that's what we're familiar with. Some of them won't, however, but they still have an important role in, in, the, in the separation process, as we'll see. Others still don't even um, at, go towards the center part of the cell. They, move, they grow towards the membrane, and even they have an important role in the separation process. So what do we need then? What do we need in order to get these two chromosomes to separate? So first of all, in order to get all of them lined up equally on the equator of the cell, we need to start pulling on the chromosomes equally. Okay, so what we need is, what we have to begin with, is that we need um, each of the sister chromatids attached to mi microtubules from the different, from the opposite spindle poles. Okay, now that involves mechanisms, regulatory mechanisms, to, to ensure that you don't get uh, both of the chromosomes attached or both of the sister chromatids attached to microtubules from the same spindle pole. That would not result in equal sharing. So there are mechanisms in order to make sure that that happens. Next, um, what we would need to do is start to generate force that, so if they're being pulled in opposite directions equally, that means that they will start to line up at the center of the cell, okay? And then if we continue pulling, increasing the force on those chromosomes, then we will generate enough force to separate them at the centromere, ca causing the chromosomes to, or the sister chromatids to uh, separate from each other. So how does that happen? So once, uh, now that we have this wall in place, the next ingredient that we need to add is motor proteins. And the motor proteins um, that we are going to be looking at are, again, the kinesins and the dynein family proteins uh, with, a, with a slight difference. So the kinesins that we'll look at, remember they are plus-end directed uh, uh, motor proteins. In this case, we'll be looking at a special type of kinesins that we're, we're familiar with this arrangement, but in this case, we'll be looking at a, a, a dimeric form of that, where you've got two of them uh, attached in opposite directions. Okay, so you've got this end that move in that direction, and this end uh, moving or trying to walk in that direction, both still towards the plus end. Okay, so how would that work? Well, they would work here, where you've got these overlapping non-attached uh, microtubules, um, you'd get these kinesin family proteins attaching here. Now, I'm only going to show one, but there'd be many in this case. So these will be walking towards that, the plus end of this fiber, whereas at the other end, you'd have the other uh, pair moving towards that end. Now, given that they are only anchored by each other, what would happen is that these two separate fibers will be starting to pull away from each other because of the walking action of the kinesins. Okay, so the two fibers, while overlapped in the beginning, because of the action of the kinesins, as they walk, try to walk in opposite directions, they are now pulling apart the microtubule fibers. So that's, that's al already causing, you know, some, I guess, some push effect on that centrosome as the fiber gets pushed in that direction. So let's just say that we've started to push these fibers now. So if we have some all also here, okay, these are trying to walk in that direction. Nope, nope. Okay, these are trying to walk in that direction. These are trying to walk in that direction, but they're connected, okay? And so they don't really go anywhere, but what they do is start to move the fibers, the microtubules, okay? So this fiber will be pushed in that direction. This fiber will be pushed back towards that direction. And now we're getting these fibers pushed. Okay, so that's the first thing that starts generating a little bit of force. And the second thing is, so while this was more like a push, the other thing is more like a pull. All right, and this is where uh, the dynenes come in. Okay, so the dynenes 
remember that they are minus end directed proteins okay uh, we'll just again we'll just draw remind ourselves of their structure okay working in pairs okay and moving towards the minus end now these dynenes are acting at the cell membrane so they are bound here at the microtubule okay like so right and they are trying to walk along this microtubule towards its minus end problem being that these dynenes are attached to the cell membrane so they're attached to the cell membrane while trying to walk towards the minus end and all that does is it starts to pull on the microtubule pulling the spindle pole closer to the membrane okay so similarly you will have a dynein right here trying trying to walk towards the minus end while being attached to the cell membrane and again pulling causing the centrosome to start moving towards the cell membrane okay all this is also happening at the other side and so we are getting the two spindle poles being pulled apart literally okay by the action of the kinesins and the dynenes and what that uh, ultimately means is that the chromosomes which are attached via the microtubules um, start to get pulled apart due to the action of these forces so now we're getting pulling force um, as the centrosomes or as the spindle poles start to pull apart um, it causes the force to ultimately be passed on to the through via the microtubules via the spindle fibers to the centromeres and pulling the centromeres of the two sister chromatids apart resulting in the separation of the chromosomes okay so just to illustrate that point okay what you'll be familiar with so basically they get pulled apart but why did they get pulled apart because there was a, you know these these microtubules were pulling on the centromere why were these microtubules pulling on the centromere because the spindle poles were being pulled apart what was resulting in the spindle poles being pulled apart well first the kinesins were pushing apart the overlapping spindle fibers a non-attached spindle fibers and secondly the dynenes were pulling on the microtubules um, that ultimately were pulling on the spindle poles pulling them apart and then ultimately the force passed on to the chromosomes that were lined up on the equator of the cell okay so that's how that works okay again microtubules plus motor proteins equals magic so finally we come to cilia and flagella okay now over there we've got the um, kind of cross section through the structure of a cilia or flagella uh, but we'll, we'll get to that in a bit now cilia and flagella um, they are very similar structurally okay so essentially what they are is at their base um, they are microtubule based structures so each of these um, ring structures that you can see is essentially a microtubule filament okay um, so their basic job is to if you have a cell membrane okay the basic job of the um, cilia or flagella is to have these long um, microtubule based um, structures that kind of push outwards from the cell um, there is a membrane that wraps around them so don't think that they're just uh, microtubules poking out into the space they push the membrane out with them okay so they are still an intracellular structure um, but yeah that's basically what a cilia or a flagella is now and they have various functions you've got this structure and now this structure can be modified to perform different functions so you generally have the cilia or the flagella and cells can contain both um, however where the flagella's main function is motility okay so the flagella has to be uh, a, a you know a moving structure okay so we'll see how 
we'll see how it does that. Okay, now cilia, cilia can be motile. Okay, but it's not their job to propel the cell. So whereas the flagella is a motile structure, it can move, and its main job is to propel the cell forward, okay, through its movement. Um, but the cilia, it can move, or the cilia structures can move, but their job is more to move the fluid around the cell rather than to push against that fluid and move the cell, okay? So the cilia, their job is to move the fluid around the cell. So if you, if a cell, for example, epithelial cells of the lungs, their job will be to move the mucus over those cells um, to remove any trapped pathogens, particulates, etc., to keep the airways clear. So it will be the cilia that are doing that. Okay. Um, however, you can have cilia that are not motile structures, okay, so they are more fixed, they are not moving around, essentially that's not their job to move, their job is to detect, perhaps detect movement that might be happening around them and their, their structure might be to do with that. So those fixed cilia have more of a sensory function, okay, but we'll leave it there for now. Now let's look then at this structure and how it might um, be able to generate movement. Okay, so generally speaking that is a cilia, but let's just summarize the cilia. Okay, so the cilia, uh, generally speaking, they are more numerous, so a cell may have many cilia. So the cilia are more numerous, but they are shorter. Okay, they still have, still have the same basic structure that we'll discuss, but they are more numerous, they're more, and they are shorter. Whereas the flagella, okay, they are, there are fewer of them, so maybe one per cell, but they are longer, okay, and as we've discussed, they have a slightly different function. Okay, now, but even still, their basic structure, core structure, is the same, so let's look at that now, and how movement, how do we get this structure to move? Okay, again, you're not going to be wrong if you think the motor proteins are going to be involved. All right, so let's have a look at that now. So what I've drawn here is, you know, you might have seen this um, arrangement of the microtubules in cilia and flagella before, but what I'm going to try and do is to explain how that structure um, generates movement. Okay, and this applies to cilia and flagella, remembering that bacterial flagella have a different structure and so won't be generating movement in the same way. Okay, um, so let's begin. So we have these microtubules, so we've got these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pairs of microtubule or, or nine microtubule doublets. Okay, so in the centrosome, remember we had, uh, what was it, nine microtubule triplets, was it? Okay, we've got these nine microtubule doublets, so each of them is like a filament by itself, but then you've got two, two, two filaments together here, two filaments together here, two filaments together here, and in the center you have two kind of separate filaments in the, in the center of that structure. Now, there are various other proteins, okay, and they, they do, I mean, there's, there's more here that, than, that is really essential at our level, okay? But I think what I'm going to do is just add enough that things should make sense, okay? So what we have here are, are some proteins that allow connection to the outer filaments, okay? And the outer filaments are connected to your central structure by these radial proteins. Okay, so these proteins allow the outer doublets to be connected to the inner structure. Okay, so we have that. 
But this is the, the next part, this is where it really gets interesting and relevant for us because the last thing that I'm going to add to this diagram is the motor proteins. So part of this outer doublet are dynenes. So these dynenes, and I might get this wrong here, but these dynenes are kind of trying to walk against their neighboring microtubule filament. Okay, so just bear with me while I put all these in here. Now what we've got is we've got this inner core microtubule filament that maybe forms the basis of the structure, but then you've got these outer microtubule filaments that not only are they connected to the center, but they also have these dynenes as part of their structure and each, di each dynene is trying to walk along the microtubule of, of the next outer doublet. Okay, so however, as you can see, there's, there's, not any gonna, there's not gonna be any sliding of the filaments that's gonna be possible because they are physically connected to the central part of um, the, the filament, okay? Or, the, or they're connected to the central part of the structure. So there's not gonna be any sliding possible or, or any significant sliding possible, but these dynenes are still going to be generating a little bit of force and a little bit of movement by attempting to walk along their neighboring microtubules. So the only way I can really explain this to you is if you do a little experiment with me with your hands, okay? So put your hands together like this, okay? Uh, kind of loosely, but not that they can slide against each other. Now, if you try, so they're, they're connected to each other, much like the two filaments uh, might be connected via the rest of the structure. But if you try and push one hand up against the other one, you can see, even though they're not sliding against each other, there's still some bending that is possible, okay? So that's how I imagine that the dynenes are trying to walk along their neighboring microtubule but not being able to actually cause any sliding to occur, we rather just get this bending of the structure, okay? And amplified over, you know, the whole length of the structure, we might get significant bending, which might result in kind of flexing or whip-like movement of, or whip-like uh, bending of the structure as the bending kind of moves down uh, along the whole uh, cilia or flagella. Okay, so that is the cilia. Again, we have a microtubule based structure plus the motor proteins and that starts to generate some interesting functionality for you. All right, so that guys, that's the microtubules. I hope this has been a useful kind of overview of um, how microtubules are involved in various cellular activities and hopefully it gives you a little bit more context to understand, you know, the bigger uh, concepts and, and, and the bigger processes that are happening in various parts of your biology course. Keep going guys, keep working.